Our story of the Trojan War, it's so powerful, it not only creates uh, an impulse for poets to start talking about what happened before it, and we get all the prequels that we talked about in our previous lecture, uh, there's also a lot of energy spent trying to figure out what happened after it. And we have a lot of sequels uh, to the events on the uh, uh, plains of Troy. Um, there are uh, whole sets of legends that get built up around the aftermath, and each of them harkens back to uh, facts about the war, things that really happened there. Uh, and the main overarching theme is that things were just awful there and nasty. Uh, the Greeks tell this story to themselves about an awful war. And, in fact, the Greeks don't come off looking so good in that war. Uh, remember, I, we talked about uh, the, the, the parts of it that Homer focuses on in his Iliad. Uh, talk about Greek-on-Greek -Greek struggles. Uh, they don't seem to work well as a team. They've got bad leadership. Uh, there's nasty motives that uh, motivate Achilles and all the ugly things he does. Well, the Greeks uh, don't uh, put a kind of glossy-eyed view over any of the materials that happened in this past. Uh, and that also goes for what happens at the end of the war. Uh, the Greeks are, uh, they, they, main, uh, they, they hold up in, in their mythology stories about themselves doing awful things, uh, famously awful things. Um, there are a, a few moments in particular that stick out in Greek imagination about them uh, uh, going too far in their victory in the Greek War. Uh, after they uh, uh, conquer Troy and, and, and get over the walls, uh, they, uh, there, there's awful things that happen. But even beforehand, in order to get into that city of Troy, uh, they have to penetrate uh, with spies uh, in, uh, in, in a raid in order to extract the, uh, uh, from uh, the Temple of Athena a, a tiny little figure called the Palladium. Uh, this is a statue that uh, represents Athena and that is uh, well loved uh, by the goddess herself. Now, when the Greeks sneak in and pull this little uh, uh, figurine out of Athena's temple, what they're doing is they're removing a, a magical element that had a protective aura over the city of Troy. In fact, according to what they knew, they would be incapable of overturning the city of Troy as long as the Palladium resided in, in uh, Athena's temple. By removing it, they now remove this uh, extra special aura of protection around the city and they can conquer it themselves. But in so doing, uh, they violate Athena. Uh, she's upset about that. She uh, doesn't like it that her uh, palladium has been taken out of her statue, so, uh, or out of her temple. Uh, so they have actually done a sacrilegious violation uh, against Athena in order to conquer Troy. Um, furthermore, uh, there are nasty crimes uh, galore of, of different kinds of violence happen. Uh, the Greeks talk about themselves as murderers. Uh, they kill people in, in uh, horrible wartime rage. Uh, this is the kind of thing that happens in, in, in war poetry. So um, they, they probably could have said to themselves, well, you know, we went too far and that's what war is like. Uh, but the Greeks didn't say that to themselves. The versions of the stories that they preserve say we went too far even by our own standards. And that was awful. Uh, for example, they took uh, the little Prince Astyanax, a tiny little baby at the time uh, in the city of Troy, and just hurled him from the walls, an innocent little infant, uh, hurled him from the walls, and the, the body of the infant uh, dies by being splattered on the ground, hurled off of a distance of many tens of feet. Um, that's not something the Greeks are proud of, and yet they keep telling it in their stories about an example of their own excesses. Uh, similarly, and maybe most famously, um, the uh, Princess Cassandra uh, is raped, uh, and she's uh, raped by the warrior Ajax, um, uh, and she's raped on the altar of the Temple of Athena. The number of violations that happen here, uh, the excesses that are built into this act are so extreme and so vile uh, that the rape of Cassandra gets held up in this short list of crimes that the Greeks commit uh, when they conquer Troy. And again, this is all preserved within the Greek tradition, and they preserve it in such a way that shows that they're not just chalking it up to the excesses that heroes sometimes uh, resort to when violent things are happening. Uh, it's, uh, they just go too far. Now, when they do go too far, they set up a whole set of other stories. Uh, there are stories about um, the aftermath of the Greek 
war, uh, Greek, and, uh, uh, Greek war against the Trojans, uh, that each of them hark back uh, to this, uh, uh, this nasty episode, these nasty episodes that happened there. The, the amount of negative energy that's stirred up in Troy when the Greeks conquer it is just too much to stay confined to that area, and it leaks out, and it follows uh, the Greek heroes on their way home. Uh, the journeys home in Greek, it's called the, they're called the nostoi, uh, are the famous sequence of stories uh, that talk about the heroes, the Greek heroes, making their way home. And in each case, uh, they're, they're kind of working out uh, the nastiness that get, got built up uh, for them over in Troy. Some cases, the journey home is a little bit easier than others. Um, uh, uh, Nestor gets him, uh, a famous Greek hero that we're going to meet uh, in the Odyssey, gets himself home pretty quickly without too much trouble. Uh, Menelaus has a long sojourn. He's blown off course in Egypt. Uh, he meets the old man of the sea and has adventures uh, there. We'll learn about him in the Odyssey. Agamemnon famously uh, gets himself home. That's not a problem, but when he gets home, there's awfulness that's waiting for him. Uh, we're going to learn about that a lot when we're reading the Odyssey, Agamemnon's journey home. But the most important of all these nostoi is the one that we're going to spend the first weeks of class reading, uh, and that's uh, Homer's Odyssey, which gives us the story of the journey home of a particular uh, Greek hero, the one that we're going to spend most of our time focusing on in the first few weeks of the class. Uh, that is this great uh, man, Odysseus. Uh, we'll spend some time uh, reading his story uh, when we turn to uh, Homer's Odyssey. Uh, we'll look at the first few pages of that in our next video. But before we do, we need to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about this man. We have already mentioned his name, Homer. Uh, we've talked about his dates around 750 BCE. And there's a portrait of him. And you may even recognize this as a traditional representation of Homer. Uh, unfortunately, what this is, though, is just a traditional representation of Homer. We have no idea what Homer actually looked like. In fact, what we know of Homer uh, survives from the Iliad and the Odyssey. Uh, there is a, a window on the world and a thought world that is made very uh, rich and explicit through that, uh, those poems uh, that give us a, a, an idea about what kind of thoughts uh, the person behind the poems had. Uh, but we don't know anything that corroborates uh, who this poet was. Uh, in fact, uh, in the scholarship uh, from the previous century, there were many people uh, that had a strong view that actually there were many Homers, uh, that to talk about a single poet uh, behind a, an epic poem like the Odyssey or the Iliad was not a smart thing to do, because likely what happened is that this was a corporate effort of a lot of people uh, who were singing songs in public. Uh, these wandering bards would, uh, we know, uh, we actually know from Homer's tale, uh, wandering bards w went around and sang songs uh, for wealthy clients. And when they did, they sung parts of the, of the Trojan War legend and other things having to do with heroes like Odysseus and Achilles and Agamemnon. Uh, so the idea was developed that uh, there's a kind of corporate set of these and the whole chunks of these were kind of uh, edited together to create the documents of the Odyssey and the Iliad. And there would be no sense talking about a single Homeric voice. Instead, we'd talk about many Homeric voices. Uh, that uh, idea in the scholarship has taken a back seat now. Uh, mostly what's happened is that the coherence of the story itself uh, has just been the strongest piece of evidence uh, for the uh, scholarly field to think that likely what we have here is indeed uh, the result of a single poetic hand. Uh, at least uh, the Odyssey itself is and the Iliad itself is. It could be that they were written by different poets, um, but it is likely that they were each written by uh, a single poet. And it may well be the case that those were the same. Uh, those poets were the same. We don't know that for sure. And the scholarship it, is tinkering around the edges of that question still. Uh, but it is no longer such an urgent question for us uh, to try to uh, find uh, the half dozen or a dozen or who knows 15 or 20 voices that might be behind the Homeric legend. Instead, it it's pretty much seems at least to most of us who are studying the material these days, that there was uh, a single editorial hand, at least, uh, or a strongly uh, poetically talented editorial hand. Let's go ahead and call that person a poet. And we might as well go ahead and stick with the name Homer. Uh, it works pretty well to describe uh, based on what the traditional association of that uh, person is. So uh, we have this figure that's behind the poems uh, such as we know them. Uh, the figure is writing in a script. And luckily, the script doesn't look anything like this. 
uh, it probably would not have survived to us in, in the form that it did had the Greeks only had a script that looked like this. This is an early example of Greek writing uh, that does not use an alphabetic script. It's pictographic. You'll see it might seem uh, on first glance to resemble uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics or maybe even uh, have, have some resemblance to a cuneiform kind of text. You'll know that those are early writing systems developed in Egypt and the ancient Near East. Uh, those were made to hold, keep records of kings and, and keep track of historical events, uh, important events that uh, were of consequence for uh, uh, wealthy uh, and aristocratic uh, classes of people. Um, it also was used in Egypt and in the ancient Near East to, re to record literary evidence. So we have epic poems and stories that survive from very early periods uh, in these uh, pictographic scripts in Egypt and in, uh, and in the ancient Near East. The early Greek version of a pictographic script known as linear A and B as exhibited in this slide um, was never used to record any literary evidence. So we may well have had wandering bards going around in the early first millennium BCE or even before in the second mil millennium BCE. Likely we did have wandering bards going around telling stories, but none of them survived. Luckily, the one that does survive is Homer. And Homer survives because of the technology that you see behind me. The alphabet arrives into Greece right about the time uh, that Homer's epics are uh, current in his society. Uh, lucky for us that it made it in time. Uh, invented, as best we know, by Phoenicians uh, on the far side of the Mediterranean, um, the uh, far eastern edge make sure I got that right, of the Mediterranean. Um, and the uh, alphabet was an incredibly uh, useful uh, technology. Uh, it is written down in different characters. There are Hebrew characters, Greek characters. There's an Arabic script later and a Roman script. Um, but whatever script is used, uh, there's really only one alphabet. Uh, some have more vowels than others. Some have uh, uh, different ways of uh, treating certain kinds of consonants. Uh, but it's, it's a single technology. And it's so useful, it spreads like wildfire. Uh, around the Mediterranean through the ancient Near East. Uh, and it's thank goodness for this invention uh, that Homer uh, is going to survive. The uh, specific language that Homer spoke is a very uh, uh, interesting one. Uh, his diction is an epic diction, uh, which draws from lots of different dialects around the Greek world. Uh, it's not written in one particular dialect. Uh, it's actually written in a kind of hodgepodge of, uh, of many different ones. It would be as though a contemporary American poet was capturing the accents of the Northeast uh, in, in my own beloved Philadelphia or Boston, uh, together with accents of the American South or accents of uh, Chicago or the, uh, or the West Coast and had a kind of mishmash of them all together. Um, the Homeric uh, uh, dialect uh, represents a kind of aggregation of a corporate uh, Greek way of speaking. Um, the uh, lines in Homer are very straightforward. He writes in a dactylic hexameter. Uh, that is a, uh, a line made of six metrical feet. And each of those feet is made up of a dactyl, a long and two shorts, a dumb ditit. So the basic element of Homeric epic poetry comes down to a long and two shorts. Uh, string six of these together uh, with an and caps at the end. That's what the X means. That can be either long or short. String six of these together and you've got a Homeric line. String 15,000 of them together and you've got the Iliad, 12,000 of them together, and you've got the Odyssey. Uh, pretty extraordinary feat for him to be able to write uh, elegant, beautiful, metric poetry uh, over the course of many tens of thousands of lines. Um, uh, it's also the case that any of these dactyls, uh, a long and two shorts, can be replaced by a spondy two longs. On occasion, this metrical information will be useful for us to have, so I wanted to make sure that we had it. Next, we get to get started. Uh, we're going to open the Odyssey and see what Homer has to tell us about this greatest of Greek heroes, uh, this uh, character Odysseus. Uh, we're going to meet in him uh, wonderful qualities uh, of a person that uh, is bringing all his human uh, 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 characters, uh, his human qualities to bear, uh, trying to solve all kinds of difficult situations and get himself out of trouble uh, and also lots of times getting himself into trouble. Uh, we'll turn to that next.